Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Shannon Sharp for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Sterling Sharp. Thank you, everyone. The people from the Hall of Fame tell me I only have eight to 10 minutes to do this. No chance. <laughs> First, I'd like to personally thank the 44 men and women that went to a room on February 5th and deemed my play on the field worthy of this prestigious honor. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the City of Canton, the Pro Football Hall of Fame itself, and all the volunteers for their hard work to make this such a great event. Your efforts are greatly appreciated. I keep telling myself I'm not going to get emotional today, but I know that's not going to happen. At this moment, I'm extremely proud and excited where my 14-year NFL journey has taken me and my family. And today is the culmination of that journey. 2121, George Hallis Drive, Canton, Ohio. Today I'm humbled to be joining such an elite fraternity of great players who've defined our game. I want to start by congratulating my fellow inductees who I share the stage with today. I'd also like to recognize the Elite Seven that is the number of tight ends that have already been enshrined. Today, I become the eighth member. Thank you, guys. I'm honored to become a member of your select group. We lost one of our members early last month, John Mackey. My prayers and my deepest sympathies goes out to Miss Sylvia Mackey and the Mackey family. All these years later, nothing makes me prouder than when people call me a self-made man. I had a certain persona as a player, and I know this will come as a shock, but I like to talk. It's a trade I picked up from my mom and from my brother. A reporter once told me he could hear the tape recorder smiling when I got on the roll. But please, don't let the persona overshadow the person. The persona liked to have fun. The person knew when it was time to get to work. People often ask me, how does a small town kid from Glenville, Georgia, who went to Savannah State College, now Savannah State University, who win three Super Bowls, and at one time, own all the significant receiving records for a tight end, I want all you young people out there to listen to my answer. It's called the three Ds, determination, dedication, and discipline, three traits that translate in any generation and any job setting. There's a reason they call it chasing your dreams and not walking after them. Don't hope someone gives you an opportunity. Create one for yourself. When I left my grandmother's home, when I left my grandmother's home in 1986, headed to Savannah State with two brown grocery bags filled with my belongings, nothing was going to keep me from realizing my dreams. When people told me I wasn't going to make it, I listened to the one person that told me I was, me. You may not know this, but I was never supposed to be a Hall of Fame tight end, or any kind of tight end, or even a Hall of Fame player. I'm here today for a lot of reasons. Some have everything to do with me. Some have absolutely nothing to do with me, and everything to do with the kindness and patience of all the people that guided me through my life. 
I want to take a moment to personally thank some of these people who made this possible. Miss Elaine Keels, my high school remedial reading and Spanish teacher. And I know what you're saying, remedial reading and Spanish? I was saying the exact same thing. She said it would help me, it would help my reading. I said it would help me repeat my sophomore year. I think she just wanted me to take the class so she could have extra hands on time to help a young Shannon Sharp. Thank you, Ms. Gills. <laughs> William Hall, my high school football coach, track coach, and driver's ed teacher. Coach Hall has been teaching and coaching for 50 plus years, and he's still coaching today. And I know some of you might be in awe of the number of years, but it's the number of miles. He drives 65 miles one way to get to school. Thanks, Coach Hall, for all your wisdom. Thanks, Coach Hall, for all your wisdom, your guidance, your understanding that you've given me and my family over those 50 plus years. Hopefully, all those miles you've driven seem worth it today. All these people have something in common. They believed in me and so did my first NFL head coach, Dan Reeves. He remembered to draft me, but somehow forgot to cut me. Thanks, coach. I'm glad you have a lousy memory. I just want to share this little story with you how close this moment came to not happening. Our last preseason game, my rookie year, we were playing the Arizona Cardinals. One of the coaches come to me and tell, he says, Shannon, your name's on the board to be cut tomorrow. He says, I don't know how much you're going to play. I don't even know if you're going to play. He says, but if you play, play really hard so you have something on tape. So if someone else, if we release you, someone else can say, okay, this guy can play a little bit. And it started to rain. And I remember driving to the stadium as it started to rain. And I'm saying to myself, we're not going to throw the ball. How am I going to show what I can do? I played on special teams, and I got 20 offensive plays. Had 12 knockdown blocks. I'm not proud to say I was cutting everything to move. When they went back into the room on Saturday, my name was off the board. I made it. I would also like to thank Wade Phillips, our defensive coordinator with the Broncos at the time, who looked at a certain scout team wide receiver and tight end and said, Dan, let's put him in the game and see if they can cover him, because we sure can't. Football, of course, is the ultimate team game. You don't land here without the support of hundreds of dedicated men whose sacrifices help you become a better player. I wish I could mention all of these guys by name, but unfortunately time doesn't permit that. I want to thank all of my head coaches, my offense coordinators, my position coaches, who diagrammed plays and had the confidence in me to call those plays that helped make today possible. I'd like to have a very special thanks to Mr. Pat Boland, owner of the Denver Broncos. Mr. Art Modell, former owner of the Baltimore Ravens, whose, whose wife, Pat, whose, whose wife, Pat, is a little under weather. I want to take this opportunity to wish her a speedy recovery. I'd also like to thank the fans of these two great franchises. Without you, there are no Super Bowl rings, no receiving records, no bronze bust. To all my former teammates at Glenville High, Savannah State, Denver and Baltimore, hopefully, hopefully, you thought I was a good teammate and you enjoyed me as much as I enjoyed you. Then, of course, there's my quarterback and great friend, John Elway. His place, his place in these halls tells you what kind of player he was. I want to take a moment to tell you what kind of man he is. John had never heard of Shannon Sharp or Savannah State. But not only did he embrace me, he chose me as his go-to guy. In my first game, starting at tight end, they put me in motion the entire game. 
As I would motion past John, he would turn around and tell me what I had to do. Block the end. <laughs> Block the linebacker. <laughs> Runner out. Run a corner. We won the game. I'm standing on the sideline. I can see John walking towards me. And instead of being angry, upset with me, he walks up to me and he says, I think next week, next week we need to learn the plays. <laughs> Thanks, John, for teaching me how to be a pro. Someone once said, other things may change us, but we start and end with family. As I stand here at the end of my journey, I know I wouldn't be here without my family. To my three kids, Kayla, Kiara, and Kaylee, thanks for understanding when I promised to take you to the movies or the amusement park or to the mall. But, but because I had run myself into the ground or lifted myself into oblivion earlier that day, I didn't do what I had promised to do the night before. Thank you for making all those sacrifices that other kids never had to make so your dad could live out his dream. Katie, thanks for your love and support and being here today and to share with me this very special occasion. Thank you. Mom, I know my grandmother gets, my brother and I, we talk about her a lot, but this day doesn't happen without you. What can I say? Your baby's in the Hall of Fame. Thanks for all the sacrifices you've made. I was the first kid in Glenville to have a pair of Air Jordans a Mickey Mouse watch and a Walkman. Whatever my brother and sister and I asked for and you could get, you got. And oh yeah, Sterling and I forgive you for those all white suits you bought for Easter that made us look like John Travolta. <laughs> my big brother Sterling, I'm the only player of 267 men that's walked through this this building to my left, that can honestly say this. I'm the only pro football player that's in the Hall of Fame, and I'm the second best player in my own family. If fate had dealt your different hand, there's no question, there's absolutely no question in my mind, we would have been the first brothers to be elected to the Hall of Fame. The 44 men and women that I thanked and congratulated early for giving me and bestowing this prestigious honor upon me, all I do is ask. All I can do is ask in the most humblest way I know how, is that the next time you go into that room or you start making a list Look at Sterling Sharp's accomplishments for a seven-year period of the guys that's in the Hall of Fame at the receiver position and the guys that have the potential to be in this building. That's all I ask. I don't say, hey, just do that. The next time you go in that room, think about Sterling Sharp's number for seven years. That's all I ask. Sterling, you're my hero, my father figure, my role model. You taught me everything I know about sports and a lot about life. I never once lived in your shadows. I embraced it. My sister Libby, the caretaker of the family, my best friend, my sounding board, my biggest fan. Of the three of us, you've had the toughest job. So my brother and I could live out our dream. You took care of the most important person in our family, our grandmother. The last two and a half years haven't been easy on any of us, least of all you. Every other day you were driving to different hospitals so our grandmother could get the best care. The eight to ten hours a day of sitting in the nursing home so our granny wouldn't be alone. That just didn't start two and a half years ago. 
You've been with my grandmother for 41 years. Thanks for being there for my grandmother and me. I love you, big sis. Last but not least, I think this is where I start to get emotional. My granny. See, the guy that did, that did this bust here, he went to school for that. He's trained to bring clay to life with his hands. It's my turn to bring Mary Porter to life with my voice. It's time for me to give Mary Porter a face for all those that don't know who she is. It's my turn now. What do you say about a person that gives you everything but life? How do you start to say thank you, Granny, for a woman that raises nine of her kids and your mom's three, and she sacrificed more for her grands than she did her own? You see, my grandmother was a very simple woman. She didn't want a whole lot. My grandmother wanted to go to church and Sunday school every Sunday. She wanted to be in Bible study every Wednesday. And the other day, she wanted to be on a fishing creek. It was my brother's and I job to make sure she can do that for the remaining days of her life. My, the only regret that I have in my 43 years that I never told my grandmother just how much she mean to me. See, my grandmother and grandfather, they raised me and I hung on everything they say, but they didn't know it. I can tell you every time that my grandmother's ever been said it, upset at me, I can tell you why. My brother never knew that everything he said, that I hung on it. I wanted to be so much like my brother that when I went to college, my brother's first college girlfriend, when I went to college, my first college girlfriend looked exactly like his. I remember getting ready to go to Savannah State with those two brown grocery bags in 1986. And a teammate of mine that was going to the very same school blew the horn at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on an August day. My sister was laying on the, the couch. My grandmother was laying in the room, and she could see me as I was getting ready to leave, but my grandmother never got out of bed. My grandmother never told me when I was getting ready to leave for Savannah State. She, said, she never said, Shannon, don't do drugs. Shannon, don't drink. Shannon, go to class. Shannon, do your homework. Shannon, be respectful. Shannon, iron your clothes. She figured she had laid that foundation for 18 years. A 10-minute speech wasn't going to work now. One of my best friends that's already in the Hall of Fame is Michael Irvin. As I talk to him, and I can talk to him about anything, they say, you don't know a man's pain unless you walk a mile in his shoes. But you can't walk a mile in Shannon Sharp's shoes because that wouldn't do it justice. You need to walk 20 years in my life. You need to walk 20 years in this body to feel this raging inferno that I felt to get out of Glenville, to leave that thousand square foot cinder block home with the cement floors, to leave with my grandmother say, baby, is it gonna be the gas this month that I'm gonna pay or is it going to be the lights? Do you want to eat or do you want lights to see and so you can do your homework? Son, do you want the phone just in case there's an emergency we can call somebody? What is it going to be this month? That drove me. That drove me. Nobody ever knew how much this five alarm fire raged inside of me. My sister didn't know, my brother didn't know. But it raged. I had to leave Glenville. I had to make a better way for my brothers, for my sister, for my mom. I didn't want my kids to live one life, one hour, not one hour in the life that I had, let alone a day. And I neglected my kids. I missed recitals. I missed football practice. I missed graduations because I was so obsessed with being the best player I could possibly be that I neglected a lot of people. I ruined a lot of relationships. 
but I'm not here to apologize for that because it got me here and it got them to a life they never would have enjoyed had it not been for that. I want to leave you with this. My position coach who's sitting right there in the stand, Les Steckel once asked me, he said, son, why do you work so hard? Every time at lunch, you're not eating, you're in the gym, you're working out. You study harder, you practice harder, you have more fun. I said, Les, I never want to eat cold oatmeal again. I said, you don't know what it's like, Les, to grow up like I grew up, to eat the animals that I ate. I remember eating raccoon. I remember eating possum. I remember eating squirrel and turtle. I remember those days. I said, I ate that now as a kid, but I'm not going to have to eat that when I become an adult. And the one story I want to leave you with to tell you why I became this person. When I was 12 years old, I told my mom, I said, Mom, I'm going to have some money one day, and I'm going to buy you a Mercedes, and I did. When I came and I asked my grandmother, I said, Granny, what do you want? She always called me her baby. She never called me by my name. I said, you want me to buy you a car and teach you how to drive? She said, no, son, I don't, son, I don't want that. I said, Granny, do you want jewelry? She said, no, son, I don't want that. She said, son, I want a decent house. And I'm thinking, I said, well, my grandmother wants seven, 8,000 square feet. But then I knew my grandmother, knowing her like I know her, after pausing for five or six minutes, I said, Granny, what is a decent home? And I remember it like yesterday, and it was 30 plus years ago. She said, son, I want a decent home. And her words verbatim is, she said, son, I want to go to bed one night. And she said, I want God to let it rain as hard as he possibly can. And I want him to let it rain all night long. And she said, I want to wake up and not be wet. That's a decent home for my grandmother. That's all she wanted. See, for 66 years, my grandmother never went to bed and have it rain and not be wet the next morning. See, I remember those days of putting the plastic coats on the bed. And I'm going to date myself the croaker sacks, but now we call them burlap bags. I remember that. I remember putting the pots and pans on the floor to catch the rainwater. The very pots and pans that we're going to cook in the next day. I remember that. It broke my heart that my grandmother, all she wanted, she got two grand boys that's making a million of dollars and she wanted a house that wouldn't leak. That's all she wanted. That's all my grandmother wanted. For two boys that's making millions and all you want is a decent house, you want to go to bed and not get wet when you wake up. That's what drove Shannon. That's what got me here. When I did the special, we were going down, my brother and I was going down to shoot a special. That Thursday, my sister called me about nine o'clock that Wednesday night. She said, Shannon, she's gone. I said, for real, Libby? She said, she hung the phone up. My girlfriend and I were laying in the bed. She said, you okay? I said, I'm fine. I said, I just want to lay here and I just want to think. As I'm driving down, I got my headphones on because I don't want to talk. And I'm trying to gather in my mind what I'm going to say when I see my grandma laying in that casket. And before I did the interview, I remember going by King's funeral home that had my grandmother's body. And I rubbed the head. My, grandma, my sister had her hair braided. And I rubbed the head. And I already knew what she would want. I said, now granny, I promised these people I would do this. But if you say no, I think they'll understand. See, my grandmother, if you give your man a word, you give a man your word, you do what you say you're gonna do. See, when my grandfather died, I didn't miss, I missed one day, I missed the day of the funeral. My grandmother didn't believe in that. If you promise somebody you're gonna do something, you do it. And as my grandmother was laying in that casket on Wednesday, on Saturday morning, I walked over to her. And I asked her two things. I asked her two things. I said, Granny, 
Am I the man you thought I would be? When you got on the train and you came to Chicago and got me at three months, am I the man you thought I would be? And I stood there for about 20 seconds and I can see her smiling. And then I asked her, are you proud? I said, Granny, are you proud of your baby? Because everything I've done in my life, I've tried to please you. I know my grandmother's proud. I know my family's proud. This day means so much to me because I get to share it with that guy right there. You'll never know. When he put that jacket on me last night, there's two people in this world knew what we were thinking. There were two people in this world knew what we felt at that very moment. And we felt it at the very same time. Guys, I'm so honored to be a part of this. I'm so honored. You don't know what this means to me. There's, you know, you, you play in the National Football League, you say you're, you're a member of the fraternity. But this is the fraternity of all fraternities. Deacon Jones once said, everybody in this room here could catch the other person that's in this room here. Nobody is better whether you're one or you're 267. Guys, thank, for me, thank you for allowing me to share 14 minutes and 23 seconds of your time. Thank you. <laughs> oh, God, I love it. Well, Tom, that was uh, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. With the, the emotion, the honesty, the truth, where Shannon came from and where he ended up, and, and that is the dream. I may be in the Hall of Fame, but I'm the second best player in my family. Sterling Sharp sharing the moment with his Hall of Fame brother. So much more coming back. Stay with us.